questions during our question sessions, and we're going to have a couple of them throughout the presentation and at the end. You get a koala for each question you ask. Now, having been in the 31 32 pit for almost the entire time, I know these are very valuable, and you probably don't want to have to go find this in the pit area. So make sure you have a question ready, because we have enough koalas, I think, for everyone in this room. Should we just start? Sure, let's What's go. What's the question? <laughs> How many teams are in Australia? There are 500 teams across the first progression, including at 40 for FRC. Not enough. Toby. <laughs> um, I don't know if all the states are involved because I know not all the territories are involved, and we have some very large territories in Australia, so we kind of include them in the states thing. And um, the Northern Territory, I don't believe, has any teams anymore. They used to have some, but not yeah. at the moment. Yet, yes, yet. Oh. <laughs> there we go. One last question before we get going. Why is it called the island bear? I don't know the answer. Because uh, it's not inside? <laughs> Alright, and with that we may actually get started with the content of the presentation. Don't worry, if there's more time for questions, you will have your chance to get a koala. All right, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the history of the Robots in the Outback, how this began, and um, what we did this year. All right, so the first question everyone asks is, why are you guys doing this? And it boils down to two things for me personally, and I think for all of us involved with the program. First off, as you all know, I'm sure, first is for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. And that's our goal, is to inspire and recognize incredible students in the fields of science and technology. You've heard it a million times. You've listened to Dean Kamen talk about it. You don't need to hear me talk about it more. But the thing that it comes down to for 3132 is our mission statement, STEM for everyone, everywhere. And we want to bring first to everyone and everywhere. And you can't do that if you're not willing to go into places like the Outback. These kids are not easy to reach. <laughs> we have some of them here. Because they're so remote and they're so rural. And a lot of times they've been deemed too hard to reach because they're too hard to get to them. But if we're going to bring STEM to everyone everywhere, we have to bring it everywhere. And the part of that is going into the Outback, which is why we're doing this, is to inspire students in these rural and remote communities. The program started last year in 2015 in two small towns. They were called Ivanhoe and Yanko. We traveled to both. You can see, I don't know, it's a little dark here, but the population on that science is 350. That science is pretty out of date. That includes flies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it does. Um, there are actually only about, it's just under 150 at the moment, population. Um, and their county, so just their county, is the size of West Virginia. And they are the third largest city in the county. The school draws for a third of the county, so a third of West Virginia is the entire school, K to 12. Actually, hang on, we've got more koalas. Take a guess how many kids are in the school. K to 12, population 150. Is that just the town, but really, they, they draw from a wider area. No. Any other guesses? Yeah? 42. Close? -ish. No. No. Very close. 36. 35. The women went there, there were 30. That was last year. This year, there are 22. In the high school, we didn't think they were going to be able to have a team this year because they were down to one student. Thankfully, another family moved into town and they got up to five, so we were okay. <laughs> and high school in Australia is year seven to 12, so in five grade, they had five kids. That tells you a little bit about how rural and remote, and that's a third of the size of West Virginia again. So these are really remote communities. Yanko is, it's, I mean, it's massive. They've got 3,000 people, so. Um, next slide. So the reason we went to Ivanhoe in particular was because of this man. His name is Professor Bruce Downton. He used to work at Harvard, and he brought health care to children around the world. He's now the president, and or vice chancellor, as you would call him, of Macquarie University, where we're based, and it's the home of First Australia. He came to us and he challenged us to go reach the students of Ivanhoe, and that's why we first went there, was 
because if the president of the company comes and says, can you do this, you always say yes. And uh, we went there, and it was amazing and incredible. Um, when we went, we work in a lot of low-income communities in Sydney, some of the worst suburbs of in the entire country. And when we go into these suburbs, they say thank you, which is lovely. But when we were in Ivanhoe, they were still saying thank you, but every single teacher, parent that we met in the single pub in town, and the principal of the school kept saying thank you for not forgetting our kids. They weren't thankful necessarily for the program. They were thankful that someone remembered them. Because for years, no one has come. It's been the truck or two that happens to go through the town, and that's it. They are truly the forgotten kids of the entire world. And that's when it hit us, the true power of this program. It's more than just science and technology. It's getting these kids a hope for the future. Because right now, their only hope is moving to a city. And we want to show them that science and technology are cool and that they actually can make a difference in Ivanhoe with science and technology. All right, so that was 2015, Ivanhoe. They actually did really well. They won Rookie Inspiration at the Sydney Regional, which was fantastic. And out of the six kids that were on the team that year, uh, five of them intend to go to university now, which was pretty amazing. So we had this incredible experience in 2015 with Ivanhoe, and we thought, right, how do we make it bigger? How do we reach more of these forgotten kids? Because it was a life-changing experience for all of us on that trip, and we wanted to bring that to more kids and more people. So we decided, all right, it's time to scale up, just like the robots this year. And uh, we thought, who better than Google? Google is the masters of scale. You look at Google and their scalability, it's incredible. So we talked with Google about it, their incredible sponsor of First in Australia, and they said, you're right. What would you do if we gave you $300,000? said, huh, we could start 150 FLL teams and 15 FRC teams. And they said, all right, here you go. I said, okay, oh no, now we need to go do this. <laughs> um, to date, it was for over two years, and I am proud to say today we have 130 out of those 150 FLL teams and 11 out of the 15 FRC in one year. So we've done pretty good. Yes. You happen, it's like two slides away, I promise. You were just ahead of me. <laughs> um, so one of the interesting things we found is because we did have these FLL and FRC grants available is we found a lot of communities, the 130 we put FLL into, I would say out of our 11 FRC teams, probably half happened to have already had the FLL grant. And that's how they heard about the FRC grant. And now that we've done FRC, all those communities, well, most of them, I think you guys are one of them, want to have that FLL grant. So we're seeing the cycle of they get one and then they want the other. So it's totally transforming their school systems from both the high school and the primary or elementary school as they're called here. And it's been incredible to see this. There's now a thread, uh, there's a Google group, a chat group for all of the coaches and there are already threads going around about, all right, we want to get it into our curriculum. Who's going to help us do it? Because they've seen the power of this program and now they want to make it a class and elective all the way through high school. So we're seeing it integrated into curriculum. We're seeing it going into the entire school system, primary and secondary, and that's just incredible. And that's after one year. Hang on, I promise we'll get to questions. <laughs> All right, so the way we identified these communities, in particular for FRC, was we actually worked with our Department of Education. In New South Wales, our state is called the Department of Education and Training. They oversee all schools in state. And we went to them and said, we've got these grants. Can you help us find some teams? And they said, sure, what do you want? What we wanted was a passionate advocate in each community. So we identified teachers um, in each of these schools or a community leader in some cases who would be able to help us. So in our case, it was mostly teachers we were looking for, not parents, but you could identify parents. So we went to the government, um, the premier's office, which is the equivalent of like the governor in the state here. He, their office was also helping us with this. And through that, we were able to identify the communities that we wanted to target in state. With that identification, we then um, had an application process. 
So what they had to do was we put together a template for a business plan that they had to complete. They then had to send that back to us um, for editing, and that counted as their application, at which point they received the grant from us. Now, if you look at the Argosy grant for rookie teams, it turns out you have to submit a business plan that our template happened to fit perfectly into. So we then had each of these teams apply for the Argosy Grant Foundation, or Argosy Foundation grant, and nine out of 11 got it. So that was just some extra funding for the team, as well as extra funding for the program, so that way we could help them do more things. So one of the things that we were able to do, because we got all these Argosy, well, the teams got all the Argosy Foundation grants, was they all got pneumatic wheel upgrade kits. Um, that was something that we purchased for them. That way they could build better robots immediately. All right, so this is just a short case study. This is Naruma, which happens to be very close to Aladella, who we're gonna get to here in a second. Uh, Naruma, they have an amazing woman there. Her name is Gail Allison. She's an incredible teacher. I don't know how long she's been teaching, um, but I imagine a long time. Do you guys know? All day, all day. Yeah. All day. <laughs> um, she is amazing and a force of nature. So they, of course, put together their template application, sent it to us, and it's the RFC Foundation. But they decided that wasn't good enough because it was a pretty basic business plan. They then completed a full business plan, including a vision and mission statement. And this is before we'd even gone out there. They hadn't even done a single season, I should note, or been to a competition. And their vision and mission is to transform the southeast, their town, into the STEM hub for the southeastern part of the state. Now there's nothing in the southeastern part of the state besides farmland. There's no really major cities. But they want to transform their community into a STEM hub. And they're working to do that. They are becoming self-sustaining through um, this thing we do called the Fisherman's Institute. Basically we give them a loan to buy EV3 kits, which they then use to run robo camps and then generate funding through that. To date they've raised over $3,000. Um, so they will be on their, they're well on their way to raising their entire registration fee for next year, which is incredible when you consider the fact that they've got 10,000 people in town. So how do we know what worked? How do we know these teams are really happy and we did inspire the kids? Well, after the Australian Regional, they all seemed really enthused. We had some great outcomes, which I'll get to in a minute. But already I'm getting emails from the kids that were on the teams so when's the Duel Down Under, which is our off-season event? C could we come to that? Because we want more of this. How do we get more of this in our school? What is it? And can we come? And do we have to pay a fee? And how would we raise the money for the fee? They are already looking towards next year and next season and what they can do, which is so incredible to know that we've made a lasting impact. It's not just going to be a one and done. All right, so the other really cool thing that we had happen was we, the Thunder Down Under, our second old pick, and the Sydney Regional was a team called 6035 House of Aladella from Aladella, New South Wales, which was one of the robots in the Outback teams, and we went on to win the Regional. So they are here today, they're actually in the front row, so I'm gonna invite them up, and we're gonna do a little Q&A panel with them so you guys get a chance to ask questions of people who are actually in the program. So I might kick it off, even though you guys don't seem shy of questions, which is good. It's Aladella. It is all the dollar. It's all the dollar, but if you ask any of the announcers, it's all the dollar. Gotcha. Um, that was my biggest challenge when I was managing this, was I had to learn how to say all the town names, which as you can tell, I'm originally from the US, so saying things like Naruma and Wiwa and Oladala. It, it was a challenge, but we got there. Interesting things. All right, so can you start off by introducing yourselves and grab a mic and uh, just tell us, I guess, what grade you're in or what your profession is. <laughs> I'm Ben McKay and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just um, in 10. 10th grade. 10th grade. You can, whatever. I'm Jaden Lee McCoy and I'm grade 10. Um, my name's Andrew Lake and I'm an industrial arts teacher. Alright, and so what was the biggest thing you guys got out of the program? Our trip to America. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get to America? What was that process like? A big plane. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Actually, it's several big planes, but yeah. Um, How did we get to America? Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about the fundraising process? Oh, like the fundraising. Money you raised and that sort of thing? Well, we got back home after 
winning in three hours more of just driving back home the same night. Um, and yeah, having the vision, like, we didn't know how much money we needed. And then I was told 40,000, and then that apparently turned into 50,000. And it was uh, 4,400 a student. That's in Australian dollars, so. We don't <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, how much money did you guys raise? So, um, some of the local stores, to restaurants, did like nights where they all the money they raised that night came to us and our kind of like fundraiser. Uh, we had plain donations they could make whenever, um, and that was one big night where the, our ex servos club. Um, held a night, which was kind of really big. <laughs> um, and we raised $12,000 for them? Uh, $27,000 in one night from the fundraiser. $27,000? Um, all up we raised, uh, well, it was somewhere under $70,000 in three weeks. So that was, we got a community of Give you an idea. We've got a community of about 16,000 people, um, and it pretty much doubles in holiday times. It's like a um, fishing, surfing holiday place. Really quiet, small community. Mind you, we've got a uh, public school of 1,300 population in the high school, so pretty sizable school. Um, and we ended up with a team of nine. Um, so we start our school holidays as in the period that the first competition starts. So a lot of the kids weren't willing to give up their holidays to come in. Um, that sort of changed very rapidly when we won the Australian Nationals and we announced the trip to America and they saw what we actually built. They were picturing little toy robots. Um, and yeah, they sort of changed the face of things quite a bit. There's a lot of kids that have suddenly taken interest. The whole community's got on board. Um, it's been incredible. Um, been a, a really good story. A lot of people have been really happy to get involved. So I'm just amazed if 16,000 people can come up with seventy thousand dollars. Pay for us for holiday. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cool. That's amazing. All right, yeah. open it up to the audience. Questions, chances for koalas. Yeah. So how many people? Um, well, we stuck with the team that we had, the original build team, because with the same robot, the same competition, we didn't want to get other people involved. We thought we'd give the credit to the ones that got us here in the first place. So uh, one of the kids couldn't make it, so we ended up with eight on the team. So we've got two mentor teachers, myself and another, and the eight students, and that's been our team pretty much all the way through. Done everything. We've got another question here. Yeah. So you're, you're the Australian Nationals, and you Yeah, sort of. So um, the way it works is um, we're 31, 32, Thunder Down Under, and we were the ones who got the money from Google and distributed it and all that good stuff. Um, and then we sent some of our mentors out, and we also got some people in from the U.S. Um, so we'll be talking about the people from the U.S. a little bit more. In fact, two of that's why Andy's here and Tyler's here, and they're going to be talking about their experiences going out. Um, but yeah, we were there at the beginning and also out in the towns. So James was on the people who went from 31 to 32. Good question. Yes. Yeah, so the idea is the current teams will fund themselves um, through either things like what Ola Dulla has done in incredible fundraising, or we have this uh, program where they can run robo camps in the town, that's what Naruma is doing, and become self-sustaining that way as well, which does work. Most of the towns aren't quite as remote as Ivanhoe. I think we go up to a population of the largest town is 20,000. There's a question over here too. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. I was just wondering about the uh, team structure of Ola uh, Dulla. Ola Dulla, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Everyone did everything, basically. <laughs> Came in to build robots, half of them didn't really have anything in mind. Just said, yeah, this sounds cool, we'll get involved. And they were building, coding, designing, um, photography, doing the production side of it, the fundraising, um, everything. So 
there's sort of a little bit of a, an overlap. Not everyone did everything completely, but pretty much we didn't have any choice. Sort of everyone's driven, everyone's coded. Um, to be honest, we, we haven't had a chance to stop to think about it. Um, as anyone who's been involved knows that um, the six week build time was flat out and with a small team we're in and it was through our holidays, weekends after school so we were basically living in school. Um, we got that done and thought okay we'll have a bit of a break and then of course it wasn't because we had to organise money and get up to Sydney for the competition. Then. We won up there, which we weren't expecting, and then things just got worse. Um, <laughs> and, just, um, and yeah, here I am sitting here and totally bewildered and sleep deprived and... Um, Jet lagged. Yeah, yeah. No, I could be wrong, but I believe only one of everyone who's here from Alindola had a passport going into this. You guys also had to get passports in three weeks. None of us had travelled outside of the country. Only one kid had a passport, and um, yeah, it's just... Been life changing for all of us. Uh, Andy's got one up the back. Yeah. Um, did your team have a sub team system? Like a mechanical team or was it basically on, on the mechanics and a sub team? Um, it's sort of been, like I said, everyone's sort of done everything. We've had um, the engineering students, there was a, a real overlap. Like we had four guys mostly contributing to the engineering side that have got a bit more experience. Um, but mentoring the year tens, and then the myself and the other teacher providing a bit of um, support information, and these guys were um, pivotal in getting things going and sort of establishing a little bit more of a team structure. Um, we had no idea what we were getting ourselves in for. Um, we sat there for a week and a half, two weeks, with the two boxes of stuff spread everywhere and just scratching our heads, not really sure where to start. Um, by the time they got here we had a basic robot, we had the frame built with the motors thing in there and we're sort of like, okay, what do we do now? Um, so very steep learning curve, but everyone sort of come along the journey, everyone sort of stepped in. Um, we, we had to have a big overlap, so yeah, no specialty people. I realise I should have explained one other thing that I just forgot to put in the presentation. The way the program works is Australian school was out for the first three, three weeks of build season, so during the weeks four and five of build season, they were traveling around New South Wales and Australia. So they would go to each team and spend two days there of intensive build time. And the goal was by the end of that time to have the team well established and to have the driving robot if possible. So that's the trip he was talking about. Uh, Can we just start? Yeah. Here? Uh, how old is the team? Uh, started in January. Oh, so. Alright, last question for now. Why don't we, I didn't know we didn't get over here. Let's, oh wait, did you already got a bullet, didn't you? No. No, okay, go ahead. What vision is your team looking for here? We're in uh, committees. And I just refreshed the rankings and just to give you an update, they're in 13th place right now. So. <laughs> They will be available for question and answer afterwards as well. So will you, you just want to take a seat again? And I will pass it off at this point to Tyler. All right. Uh, so I did something a little different. Uh, so this is the robot snap my presentation. Uh, but I spent a little bit of time before and after uh, going around Australia as well through a separate grant. Um, so I've been involved with FIRST for a long time. And um, my job ended up being flexible enough that I was able to take three months off as kind of a sabbatical. Uh, so I applied for a grant through the Government of Australia, uh, like for the Government of Australia to kind of propose your own program of working with schools and stuff like that. So I wanted to do it first. So um, my original idea was just to work with Sydney teams, stay in the city, and they said, oh, well, why don't you travel to some of these more remote teams that need more help? Because uh, when you look at the map, these red dots, they're really far apart from each other. And like the one way up here, the closest team is a 15 or 16 hour drive away. So they don't have people close by that they can go to to get help. And I'd be able to get parts shipped overnight or you know, overnight's not in existence from the US to Australia. And you know, it's, so it's expensive to ship things, it's prohibitive and uh, they needed help to go out to those locations. So I spent three months traveling around Australia. 
Uh, 75 days I was out there from kickoff all the way through competition. I uh, worked with 17 different FRC teams uh, and total traveled 15,000 kilometers, uh, 9,000 miles, all within Australia, uh, playing in some cars and traveling around. So, uh, so yeah, Team 3132, their big motto is helping everyone, everywhere. Uh, and they really put it to paper and uh, made it work. So uh, with the Mentors Club Road Borders program, they were able to help set me up with different teams to go out and help work with. Uh, so I really got to experience um, Australian culture, being able to go out to actual suburbs and small towns and not just see the opera house or see the bridge or you know the zoo or something like that, but actually get to stay with families and have dinner with them and stay up you know, talking over coffee and really being able to take it all in um, and get immersed in that culture. And when I got back home uh, to the U.S., I thought it was just going to be the jet lag that I'd have to worry about for a week, but it was culture shock too, going back to the States. It was so different uh, from being in Australia for so long, I got so adapted. Uh, to more just like an easygoing lifestyle and uh, the way things were and not hearing that accent and driving on the other side of the road is really weird coming back. So. Um, but yeah, one of the things I'd really like to point out about Australian teams is they're really resourceful. They're really good at working with what they have. So if there's, you know, there's one of the robots in the Outback teams that really took an old chair that was in a storage closet and ripped it apart and used part of the chair as their arm, you know, or uh, the team from Tasmania. Tasmania is an island uh, just south of Australia. And uh, since the parks have to come into Sydney and then go on a boat to get from Sydney to Tasmania, it takes a lot longer to get them parts. So uh, what they ended up using during their second year team, so they wanted conveyor belts to suck the balls in this year. Uh, so they used the drive belts from last year's drive motors as their belts to pull in the balls. So you know, using old robot parts, using chairs and stuff in the school, um, it's all fair game and it makes it a lot easier than trying to get parts overnight. So they're really good at working with what they have and it was really cool to see that coming together and just making it work. Um, I also got to experience the perspective of an international team. Uh, so I mentioned the shipping and overnight stuff. Uh, it's different being international. There's also the whole uh, unit system. So the US is real big about using the Imperial system for some reason, I'm a metric fan. Um, but it makes it hard trying to convert all those units because when you look at the manual, all the dimensions are in inches. Uh, the rules, 15 inches extension, that's all inches. So you have to convert all that really to get an idea of what you're working with and make sure that you're legal and you're working with everything. Not to mention, if you go to the hardware store, you're not going to find a quarter 20, quarter inch screw, you're going to find a metric screw. So being able to get things that work together isn't always that easy. Uh, and it's just kind of an extra obstacle uh, that they have to overcome. Uh, so there's some pictures up here of teams I have to go see. Um, and we really did get to go out far enough that we saw the kangaroos hopping across the road. So that was pretty cool. Uh, it really was an experience of a lifetime, so we're going to talk later about how you guys can apply for a program to be able to come out and do it next year. Uh, I got to see a lot of really cool stuff. Um, the Hopper House, kangaroos, koalas. I got to snorkel the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and if, depending on where you are in the U.S., sometimes it's hard to see the Milky Way. Um, but out there, out in the middle of the outback, there's no city lights at all, no light pollution. It's just beautiful seeing the stars. And in the southern hemisphere, uh, you can see the Southern Cross, which you can't see up here. So that was really neat. Um, working for NASA, I'm a big fan of astronomy. So that was really cool, just to get that Southern Hemisphere perspective, and uh, it was an awesome trip. So now I'm going to hand over to Ian, and he's going to talk about kind of what we did when we were at the schools. Thank you. As we stepped into each community, um, we kind of failed our way forward, uh, right alongside the, the students and the mentors. Um, but uh, if you fail enough, you learn something. Is that true? You kind of can't help it. Um, one of the things that really became uh, central to the initial engagement uh, when, as the team is forming is come up with a decision-making process. How many decisions would you guess, would you estimate, you had to make, let's say, the first day that we were all working together? How many total decisions were made? Just a guess. Yeah, just overall, there was, there was hundreds. A couple hundred decisions at least in a day. So if the team, has a process for making that decision, making those decisions, you can be more thorough about it. And it's kind of amazing when you go to uh, some teams that have been long standing, 
have yet to come up with kind of a formulated, just what's our decision process? Many of the communities chose to use, the, the students chose to use a hybrid method. They said, based on the importance of what we're trying to decide, we're going to give a certain amount of time. If it's not very important, we're going to give it one minute. If it's really important, we might give it 30 minutes, maybe more. And during that time, they're going to work to build consensus. Build a consensus, ensuring everybody has a voice, and all the, stuff, all the concerns and questions and, and thoughts are put out there, and see if everybody coalesces to supporting one outcome. If at the end of that time, consensus isn't reached, then vote and support the vote. So that was a hybrid decision process that a lot of the communities chose to get behind. And that gave them an efficiency to move through the hundreds of decisions that they had to make. Okay? So we also would kind of, with the student's guidance, with the student's input, work to lay out what are the different roles of a robot team. If you say a robot team is kind of like a wheel and all the different roles are spokes, what are some of the spokes on that wheel? Business. Business. Media. Yeah. Mechanical. Me mechanical. I mean mechanical. Okay. What was that other one? Media. Medium? Media. I'm teasing. Okay. Media. Excellent. So here, there, yeah. There we go. Thanks, James. Okay. So you can see that there's quite a few. Now that was three or four, right? Uh, a lot of the teams would lay out that there were probably eight, nine, or ten different roles that they thought really needed attention for their business of robotics to be successful. So as they laid those roles out, first thing on the first day, it might have been a smaller team initially. Some of the teams said, wow, we don't have people to cover all those roles. Oh, well, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, James and Tyler and I, we're going to go take tea with the, with the teachers. What are you going to do? We're going to go re recruit people. Good idea. You might want to try to get permission for it, but we don't really care. Okay. <laughs> so they go out and grab more team members. Um, how many total folks, for example, came in through Lithgow in some of that process over the two days? Yeah, so it was very explosive because it gave clarity to the students what they're doing and what are the various roles, the kind of talents and strengths and skills that they needed to, to be a more successful team. We also found ourselves very much assisting and, and in some case freelancing on our own, going to local libraries and businesses in the evening, because what else are we going to do, right? So to help keep ourselves, keep James specifically out of trouble, um, we would go to the, the library's local business. And what's the uh, name of, uh, there's a club that's in kind of every town. What's that called again? RSL. RSL, which stands for? Return Service League. Return Service League, okay? It's kind of like the American Legion or the VFW lot or Eagles Lodges and stuff here. So we would go to those places and say, Hey, uh, everybody show up in that fancy green shirt that Tyler has. And people would say, uh, in that uh, accent, you know, what are you doing here? Because <laughs> we all three matched when we walked in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of strutting in. And they're like, hmm, a couple of Yanks and a guy that we think is English, actually. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> So we would work to create more awareness so that as the students would engage those companies, they, they had a little bit of the benefit of at least some free awareness. So just because you're not in the classroom, just because you're not in the shop, that doesn't mean that your role to create awareness and, and enhance the understanding of your community is done. Actually, that's where you can be most effective in creating awareness is outside of your shop. Okay. Breaking down how mentors can help uh, in that um, you really don't need expert, uh, robot experts. Um, as Tyler pointed out just the other day, 
He said, if, uh, he said, hey, uh, <clears throat> would you like to be a robotics mentor? And they're like, a robot? What? No, I am not a robot expert. A lot of people see mentors as experts. Who here believes that to be a mentor, you have to be an expert? Excellent response. <laughs> we were going to identify you for some rapid therapy later. <laughs> Super. And the, uh, oftentimes the, um, that misconception was difficult to break down. So you, you just have to listen and, and have a dialogue with people. You very rarely can change people's minds by talking at them. More often than not, their minds are changed by listening to them. Okay. One of the transitions that um, some of the uh, challenges center around, and I think a lot, of, a lot of us have seen some of these, is sometimes when uh, a person steps into that role and they say, oh, I'm the expert, I'm supposed to just espouse what, what's going on, and everybody just does what I tell them to do. Is that how a team runs? Okay, just checking. Looking for more of those therapy candidates. All right. So. Instead, uh, there was a, a, a teacher at Broken Hill, great guy, heart of gold, wanted to be there for the students, but here's, here's why I'm going to uh, use him as an example. One, he's not here, so it's my story, right? and then two, is that it was, it was very vivid. He said, what do I do? And I said, well, try this, put your hands in your pockets, take two steps back, and repeat after me. I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> and so he would work to implement that so that it created the empty space so that the students could own as many aspects of the role as possible. Because ownership usually can only take place if there's space for the ownership to take root. If you're already occupying that space, Folks, it's hard for others to own it. So halfway through the day, I look over and he's like, just <laughs> shaking and quaking. And so I walk up, put my arm around. Hey, Mr. Man, how's it going? He goes, this is really hard. So, well, do you think it's working? He goes, it, they, they're doing more than I've ever seen. Okay, well, let's just continue to run this experiment through the full two days. You're a scientist. Let the, let the data tell you what's going to happen. So that, that seemed to give him and others pretty good space to make that transition to more fully empower students. Do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, the question is, did you, did you actually spend a lot of time training mentors at all? Oh, like, no. To be better no, mentors aren't really trainable, are they? <laughs> OK. <laughs> no. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to be flippant or, or uh, offhanded, but um, what, we, uh, what we were doing is we were attempting to model those things that we thought worked well, such as giving the students more latitude so that they can own the failure and own more of the experience and therefore drive, create their own drive to come up with new solutions instead of being focused on the outcome. So we were attempting to model that and helping the mentors consider modeling that in their own way. Does that help? Yes, sir. So uh, with that example, right? So suppose if some some students are stuck, they they are doing some working on something and they're totally stuck and they're getting frustrated. Mm -hmm. At that time, should the mentor jump in and? You one pointer or two pointers? That's a, that's a great question. Every situation can be different. That's my disclaimer. Now I'll tell you what I believe. Okay. So, you're working on something. You're stuck. Who do you ask for help? You ask a friend first. So, one of the things that to help build in resilience of the team is get the team to help one another. Do you agree? Excellent. Um, enabling students to take ownership of their own learning. Uh, 
in the, for example, drivetrain programming and other very technical aspects, there are a lot of online resources. So many times myself, here's what's true for me. I feel useless. I feel useless. So I get up in front of people so that I can feel useful. Well, that's all about me. That's not about you. So I need to spend more time zipping it and letting you and the other students make it make use of the resources that are available. Okay? That really seemed to also greatly enhance the resilience of the students and their teams. Okay? Letting the students learn through failure and iteration, it's a lot of fun. If you don't try it often, do it, okay? Do it more often. Students, who's your best teacher in life? What kind of experience do you learn the most from? What's that? Failure. Yeah. So, yeah, that was the best five bucks I spent today. Thank you, sir. <laughs> So that was what we were trying to create the, uh, um, the environment or help influence the environment, but it was the student's environment, it was the mentor's environment. We were there to help out. So, James, it's back to you, I think. Yep. Is that right? Okay. Thank you, Andy. So uh, I guess my job here is to kind of tail off the conversation about what this presentation is about, why we're talking about everything that we've talked about today. And the general gist of it is we want you guys to do this everywhere. Uh, this is a model that can be applied to all over the place. This isn't just something that's unique to Australia. You know, the United States has its own areas where it could benefit from programs, reach out to low-income areas, and provide opportunities to students that wouldn't get access to science and technology normally. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is just uh, a bit about um, the future of the program, where we're at now, where we're looking at going, how you guys can apply what we've talked about today into your own environment. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Right, so what's next? Well, first off, Google has confirmed match funding for 2017. So at a bare minimum, we're going to be doing another 150 FLL teams and another 15 FRC teams over the next two years. Uh, which is incredibly exciting for 3132 for first in Australia. Um, and we're actually looking at getting that grant tripled so that we can do this program at a much larger scale. And we want to do this because the model that we applied this year and the things that we've learned, things that are actually quite scalable and the more people we get on board, the more teams you can actually reach. There is really very little limit here. Um, so yeah, we want to expand our reach uh, with the Google funding. For first Lego League, we reached out to all of Australia so there were no places that were off limits. Uh, with the FRC level, we actually uh, stuck to New South Wales for this year, but we want to bring this to all of Australia in 2017 in terms of the initial Google funding, uh, with a particular focus on Western Australia, where we're actually looking at having our second off-season event start off in 2018, uh, and within the next three years, we're looking at having the second Australian region uh, within the space of, of four years from the initial Australian region. So we're seeing some pretty huge growth, and that's thanks to the Google funding for that. Um, we also want to scale this program outside of Australia. This isn't just about, you know, the good old Aussies. It's also about reaching out to um, everyone everywhere, and that includes uh, Iowa, Nebraska. We've also tried some things in uh, China and India as well. Uh, so we want to bring this to everyone. Um, and we'd also like to bring it to any state, anyone who's willing to actually put their hand up and say, you know what, this is something that we want to do. This